All right, so thanks for tuning in to another um, edition here of WaveLab Workflows. I'm Justin Perkins. Uh, I'm going to be talking today and showing you how to just master a single song in the audio montage. Um, to me, the audio montage of WaveLab is really kind of the heart and soul of WaveLab. You know, I master a lot of singles, albums, and e e EPs for bands and artists, and the audio montage is where I do all of that work. I have seen people try to do single song masters in the audio editor, and while you can do it, you run into a few pitfalls and limitations. So, really going to focus on the audio montage today. Um, mastering a couple um, housekeeping things. Um, I am going to be um, launching a new website probably within the next week. It's it's all done. I just have to fill in some missing information. But it's going to be a website called wavelabhelp.com, and it's going to be a place where you can watch all these videos, of course. Um, you can download, it'll be a nice place to download all my settings, which I'll, you know, update periodically when it comes to, you know, naming schemes, montage, templates, presets, and things like that. So it'd be a one easy place to download all that stuff, and then... Um, I'm going to have a way to book um, some one-on-one -on -one sessions. Over the last year with the pandemic, I've been doing, <clears throat> you know, I, I haven't really advertised it or tried to do it, but a few people, quite a few people have reached out about doing, um, two, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions, and I've done a few of them. So the website's going to have a little booking portal so you can book, you know, an hour, and then if we need more, we can do more. But it would be a good way to just set something up online and, we can go over some WaveLab stuff. It'll be on Zoom, so you can um, show me your screen. I can show you mine. We can talk. It'll be recorded, and then you can um, you know, reference it later as well. So watch for wavelabhelp.com in the next couple of weeks. Um, and hopefully you all have downloaded the 10.0.60 update for WaveLab. Um, it solves a couple bugs and adds a couple features. The main one, something I don't really use is the... Um, speaker. Uh, see, I don't even know what it's called. Let me get WaveLab open. Cause I don't. It's a cool thing if you need it, but with my setup, I just don't need it. Um, but you know, basically the speaker management, as you can see, I have it hit a speaker configuration. So um, if you're running into a bug um, with the speaker configuration, um, WaveLab 10.060 solves that. It's out. Been out for about a week or two. So. Um, Without any um, other, now that we have some people tuned in, I'm going to get into you know mastering a single song in the audio montage. Um, as you can see, I have the master section just kind of floating here. And if you've downloaded my presets, um, you can get your window looking like mine. For those that maybe haven't seen this, um, the pre my settings are linked in this um, video description. And in about a week, the website will be up. But if you're not sure where your WaveLab settings are, you can go to um, Preferences, Global, General, and Open Setting Folder. And this is going to reveal where on your computer WaveLab has all its um, settings. And it's a good idea to back up this folder. You can do um, Show and Closing Folder. But it's a good idea to back this up. But as you can see, there's a bunch of um, settings, preferences, presets for various things you know the cd wizard is a big one so this is a good folder to back up but you can download mine and if you um, carefully recreate it um, you'll have all my settings so um, that's just a quick tip and as you can see i have it saved in the sidebar here because i access it quite a bit for backing up so let's get into it um, as i mentioned the audio montage is kind of my favorite thing about wave lab um, and to make a montage, there's a couple ways. You can press this icon and choose Audio Montage. And what this is, this is a non-destructive work environment. Um, there is, of course, the audio editor. So if you just click on a file and want to just listen to it, the audio editor is great for that. Um, here's some stuff I have queued up for working on. So this is the audio editor. Everything you do in here is destructive, as you probably know by now. Um, and the only way you can really insert plugins is in the master section. 
which is fine. But then you, this has come up a few times in the last couple of weeks, new users, they're really confused by the fact that, you know, if you, um, let me just put a plugin in here. Where is master rig? If you insert a plugin in here and play the audio, yeah, it's going to go through the plugin. That's great. You can master rig has a lot of different modules you can load. So, um, that's great. But what happens is if you open another file, it's going to have the same settings. So the master section must be down here. You have to, um, save it or then load it with each file. And that's confusing for new people that are used to a DAW like Cubase where everything is of course saved within the session. So this is why I really, even for single songs, I don't use the audio editor. I like to do it in the montage because this is a bad example, but let's say this song needed to fade in. Of course we can fade in the file, but it's destructive. And if the client or artist says, can we do the fade in a little longer? It's not so easy to, it is a little easier in WaveLab 10 because we have these nonlinear undos, but basically it's too destructive for my taste. So I'm going to go over doing the single song and I'm also going to repeat the steps, but with instrumental versions, because if you're anything like me, you know, you master a song, but then they also need the instrumental version, the TV mix. So sometimes there's two or three additional versions and that's not a huge deal, but what can be a big deal is keeping them perfectly in sync. What I'm saying is, you know, they might send you two or three versions of a song and they're all exactly the same length and in perfect sync. And there's a particular type of client that wants you to keep it that way. Even if you're going to trim two seconds of silence off the start of the file or fade out the end of it, you know, maybe they let the guitar ring for 10 seconds and, you know, it should only ring for a few seconds before it fades out. Um, you want to make sure you're doing those same edits across all of the formats, right? So they sound cohesive and similar. So I'm going to show you how to do that working in the audio montage because you can kind of mirror your edits from one clip to another. So I'm going to first just do a single song and then I'm going to repeat it with doing instrumentals. And it's also going to make sure like the correct metadata is in the file, the artwork, something that's going to look really nice when you send it to your client. So it's nicely named and it doesn't look like a big mess. And so you know what it is if you have to go back and revisit it. So let's start with doing a single song. Um, as you can see, my master section is clear except for this um, metering plugin, so I'm just going to hide it. I'm not even going to use it. I have a preset dialed up where I can press Control 9 and it creates my um, preferred audio montage. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as I work, but if you don't have my presets, you can always go to File, New, Audio Montage, and there are some. Um, templates from Steinberg. You can add a template. Um, but of course, if you're starting from scratch, you can do custom and choose the sample rate. Now, audio montages are bit depth agnostic, meaning you don't make a 16-bit montage or a 24-bit. Um, it, it can load in 16 or 24-bit or floating point files. It kind of doesn't care about the bit depth because as soon as you do any processing, the bit depth increases the floating point anyway. So th this is different than a recording program where you have to set the bit depth and sample rate before you start. This really only cares about the sample rate because um, you, you handle the bit depth as you work and as you create your final file. So I have a template, which I always start from just um, control nine. And this brings up a montage, but I actually just remembered I, I recently created a singles template, which kind of comes more into play with when you're doing instrumentals because it doesn't quantize the marker. So I'm going to press control five and this is a 96 K single montage and it's very similar to the album, but the main difference really is the CD wizard settings that are stored in it. So I'll talk more about that. Um, again, when we get to the doing the single version. So, um, as you can see, I have an open slate here. Uh, there's nothing loaded. I'm going to press command I to load in a file. Um, if you're not using my presets, I believe it's shift command I to load in a file, but I do it so often that I shortened it to command command I because I just do it all the time. Um, so I have created, um, 
where I've created a to kind of simulate my workflow, I've created a, a band called the Wave Labs. And the first thing we're going to do is cold new single. And I'm going to load in the file. And kind of true to form, a lot of the files that we get are not named what the song title is. Sometimes it's close, but sometimes it's totally different or it's just final mix with no information. So I'm going to go over, you know, where do we rename that and why? Um, so even though, you know, the band is called the Wave Labs, the, the single is called Cold New Single, um, and this is the song, and I, um, I need to go back and do one thing. I always make a folder called Original Files, because I want to have a nice clean folder of wherever the original f files are. I want to be able to get back to them, because we're going to be working non-destructively, and it's just oh, how I like to stay organized. So I'm going to load in the Unmastered Mix. As you can see, it's pretty quiet. I did this on purpose. I actually turned it down a little more for a dramatic effect. But as you can see, um, you know, it's not a very loud file. And it has a lot of dead space at the end. And it has no dead space at the beginning. So it's a pretty tight start. Now, there are no rules to this, what I'm about to say. But my best practice is I like to leave about 200 millisecond. And I also picked this song because it has a really clean downbeat now it's a little different when songs ramp in if it has a slow fade of something or even a fast fade of something sometimes you may want to start at 150 milliseconds because you don't really hear you know the, the whole point here is to not be too jarring it kind of goes back to the cd days um, cd players were not super accurate when you skip to a song so if your marker was too tight to the downbeat then um, you know, it might sound strange at the start of the track. But anyways, I like to use 200 milliseconds. You can eyeball it. You can also go to the Clips tab and type in where do you want this clip to start? You know, by default, it's starting at zero. To me, that's a little too tight. Unless you're doing, if you're doing library production music, maybe you need to keep, or, or samples, you probably need to keep things trimmed really tight. If you're doing uh, music for release on iTunes and, and all that stuff. I like to leave a little buffer. There's no right. I've heard people say 100 milliseconds. I've heard people say half a second. Some of it depends on the style of music. Uh, but for all, my default kind of go-to is 200 milliseconds. So I can eyeball it, or I can also just type in that I want this clip to start at 200 milliseconds, um, which comes in handy sometimes if you need to be precise. I also like to do... This one's a little iffy. I have to listen to it. If there were a little bit of dead space, it wouldn't hurt to do the tiniest little fade in. I have to, I have to listen to this and see if it, if it helps. Uh, but yeah, let's get to saving. Sometimes I forget to save when I'm doing these videos. So once you've loaded in the file, Command S brings up this save dialog. And one thing I really like about WaveLab is it knows that you probably want to save this montage in the same folder where the original files came from, because to me that's a logical place for it. So what I like to do is. I'd like to just, and this is why I have my folder structure this way. I'm going to copy the band name, put a little dash. I'm going to copy the name of the single or release, and then I have a little shortcut to paste that. And to me, that means the, the montage is, you know, 64-bit floating point precision, because uh, that's what I have it set to in the settings, uh, 96K. And this is the digital master version one. And the little, this is just a personal thing, the little... Um, Underscore just means that this is the master montage with all the plugins. So that's all that means. And um, this, of course, goes a lot faster when I'm when you're just when you get in a flow. I can get single set up very quickly. So I'm going to save that. So it's locked in. And again, it's a montage file. So um, it is right now. It's only 13 kilobytes. It's very small, and it's just referencing the wave file. It's not creating a duplicate. And another thing that came up this past week, um, montages can only play files of the same sample. Right? You can't load in a 48K and a 96K file into a montage. It will, in fact, if you try to do that, maybe I can just show you. Let me find a file. Um, if I try to load in a 44.1 file, it's going to give me a warning, and it's going to, um, if I press OK, it would resample that. And, you know, we can talk about that later, but it can only load in files of the same sample rate. Um, so you want to make sure 
you know what sample rate you want to work at. Um, so anyways, I've got this, the start of the file at about 200 milliseconds. It's kind of a judgment call if it needs a little fade in. I find that if I don't fade in, you know, sometimes you can get a little tick or a pop, especially as you add processing. But again, this, this file is so tight, I'd have to listen to it to, to decide what I want to do with that. But for our, most stuff, when there's a little bit of a gap of dead air, it doesn't hurt to do a little fade in. Then, of course, we want to fade out the end because there's quite a lot of time here. So I can click, if you click in the, um, any actually, if you click anywhere on the side, the cursor changes to that kind of icon. And then you can just drag. Um, you could also press the S key just to delete that. Well, you press the S key to split it. And then you can click on that and press the um, the delete key. It has to be the delete, at least on Mac, it has to be the delete key that is above the arrows. It's different than the backspace. Anyway, you can do it that way and then continue dragging. You know, you can kind of list, press play and listen to it. You can hold shift and use the um, up and down scrolling on your mouse to in blow up the waveform. You know, I'm not making it louder right now. I'm just blowing up the waveform um, just to kind of see what's down there. But you can decide how long you want to let it go and then what kind of fade you want to do. You can click on this node and um, figure that out. I have a shortcut. I, I really like this exponential fade, so I have programmed a shortcut, with, which is just the letter X. And to me, that sounds pretty natural. If I do this kind of fade, it sounds good until the last very 10% or so, and then it just drops off a cliff, which is not good. So I really like this exponential fade. It's pretty much the only fade I use unless uh, for special cases where it gets a little trickier. But for 99% of um, tapering at the end of a song, this, this fade works really well for me. There are, of course, a bunch of fade shapes in the uh see i use the shortcut so much yeah of course it's in the fade menu we have fade in and fade out so there's all sorts of styles of fades but for me again that exponential one just works um, very well so let's say i've listened to this and said yep i like how that decays and then the song's done so that's the first thing i like to do i like to just get everything the song trimmed up so i can kind of get a feel for what the song is um, just kind of get that cleanup stuff out of the way. Um, the next thing, you know, there's no particular order. The next thing I might do is um, the CD wizard. Um, and I have a stream deck with a lot of this program, but for those that are perhaps more new to WaveLab, you go to the CD tab function, and there's a thing called the CD wizard. And what this does, even though we're not making a CD, um, what this does is it puts in markers. And you may wonder why it matters to have a marker for a single song, but it really does because the marker, both the mark, it's going to create a start and an end marker. That's going to define the rendered length of the file, which means it's going to add. My marker is eventually going to be right at zero. So there's going to be about 200 milliseconds of silence between the start of the file or the song and then the first downbeat, which again, Helps prevent any weird abrupt starts, uh, things like that. And then it's also going to define where the, where it ends. Now, for most singles, it's going to end where the audio ends. But I've had cases where we want another half second of a breath on the end of the song so that it doesn't go into the next song so quickly, especially, you know, if it's going to be a single, it's probably going to be on a playlist. You know, maybe you want a half second before it switches to the next song. So... The markers really control what the final file length is going to be. So that's why I run the CD wizard. Um, there's a shortcut in my preferences, which is shift. Um, see, I don't even use it anymore. Um, I'm so used to the stream deck that I've forgotten my CD wizard shortcut. It looks like it's just control C. There it is. So control C will bring up the CD wizard. Or you can, of course, if you have a stream deck, you can just program a button and there it is and yeah so one thing with my stream deck settings is not only have i programmed it to call up the cd wizard like this I, i've programmed it to press apply so in one press of the stream deck it does two or three things but you'll notice that in the single song montage uh, preset um, these are the settings that i have 
dialed up, and it's in a preset file here too. It's called no quantize, and that's because, again, with my when I'm doing um, instrumentals and alternate mixes afterwards, I don't want the markers to quantize to a CD frame because I need the tracks to be exactly the same length down to the millisecond. So that's really the big difference here. So I'm running the CD wizard to get markers. If I use the stream deck, it happens very quickly, as you see. Um, but let's let's take a look at what happens. Um, it puts the marker at the start of the clip, which is not what we want. So there's two options here. You can manually drag it over to zero. There's three options. You can manually drag it to zero like I did. You can go to the markers window and just type in zero seconds, zero milliseconds. And there's also a feature here called move multiple markers. And I have a preset. You have to do it once for this. Th this window is global, so you have to do it one time. But this is really all I use it for, so I kind of set it and forget it. I just use it to bump back the start markers and splice markers by 200 milliseconds. So if you go to markers, functions, move multiple markers, it's right there. I can press tab and the letter M with my shortcuts and it comes up. Or again with the stream deck, I can, maybe I don't have it programmed. I don't have it programmed on the stream deck, but basically we want to get this marker to zero seconds. And sometimes it's fast, it's just to drag it and it's done. So what, what's going to happen here is when I render this master eventually, it's uh, going to have that 200 milliseconds of, of digital silence, which is, again, a good thing in my opinion. And then the render is going to go to the end of the file, which I thought sounded good. Again, if I needed a breath, I could, I could back it up um, to however, however long I want this file to be. Um, so there's the uh, getting the markers in place. The next thing I could do is is name the uh, marker because naming the marker is actually really important. You can see that the marker takes on whatever the name of the file was. That's what the file was called, and that's what the marker is. It, for me, in my other workflow, this works well because when I have done analog processing and I'm just finishing up a project in the montage, my files are all perfectly named as the song name. So that just saves me a lot of time downstream. With this particular process, I'm doing an in-the-box digital master, so the file name is what the client named it when they sent it to me. And I, I like to keep the file names because sometimes it'll be called Mix 3, Mix 4, Vocal Up, and you want to know what that was because they might ask you, hey, did I send you Mix 3 or Mix 4? And if you've renamed the file, then you don't know anymore. So I always keep the file names from the clients exactly as they were. Now, it could be tempting to rename the song in the Clips tab, but again, I don't like to do that because if you open your montage later, you could, uh, and you've renamed it, then you don't necessarily know which version it was. So we really want to rename in the Markers tab. So of course you can manually type the song name, but I'm not a fan of manually typing if I don't have to. I'm gonna grab the name of the song just copy it and paste it in there. So now I have my marker perfectly named as the song title. And you want to make sure there's no spaces after it because that can be a problem later. So now I've named the marker, which again comes in handy for metadata purposes down the road. Um, the next thing I might want to do is um, get this song to a certain level before starting. Um, something I've talked about in the last couple videos, and I think... I think a number of mastering engineers do this, and if they don't, I think it's a really good thing to, to do. For me, it really helps. What I'm going to do here is normalize this file. And when you think of normalizing, usually you think of after mastering. You know, streaming services normalize the level, but that's not what I'm talking about. I like to normalize the file before I do any processing because I have kind of a, a really good starting point as far as gain staging and, and gain structure with some of my plugin presets. And of course I listen to the song and decide what it needs, but just from a strictly a level standpoint, this gets me 80% there. And then I can decide how loud do I want to take this? Do I have to make some EQ changes to get it louder or some other types of changes to get it louder? So, um, but again, normalizing from the start really helps me out. Wave Lab has a great feature called the 
meta normalizer. And I, I purposely made this file quiet so you can really see how it changes. So if you go to the um, process tab, there's this little thing here called meta normalizer and you can click on it. Um, if you're using my shortcuts, it's shift and the letter M for meta and it brings up this menu. And I have a couple, only have a couple presets. One preset is for in the box work. One preset is for out of the box work because th this level is slightly different for feeding my analog chain, but the ITB means in the box, means all digital. Um, and there's no right number. I've chosen minus 16 LUFS because for me, if I'm going to use an analog simulation plugin, like a tape simulator, um, this seems like a good level that doesn't overload it. Whereas if I normalized it to minus 12, that's not necessarily bad either. But if you, if you load in a plugin that, um, you know, a simulating analog tape or analog device, it might, might be overdriving it too much. So I just decided one day that this is a great level to start with. Um, you know, maybe minus 18 could be a little more, um, conservative. It really depends on your preference, but my whole point is pick something and then your life gets easier downstream. I've also chosen top of loudness range and there's a few, cause you know, we're going to set a loudness, but using what parameters do we want the loudness of the entire clip to be minus 16 LUFS? Um, maybe not because if it's a really dynamic song that goes from quiet to loud, um, to get an average of minus 16 LUFS, the loud part's probably going to be extremely loud, and that's not what I want because it's going to hit my processing chain too hard. So I like to use this unique feature at a wave lab called top of loudness range. And for the most part, this makes sure that the loudest moment of the song is minus 16 LUFS. This comes in handy for um, setting up an album master too, because if you run this on all the songs, it means that kind of the loudest part of each song is going to hit your chain kind of at the same level. And that's, again, a great starting point. You still need to listen to it and work on it, but really good ballpark starting point. Um, so I'm choosing top of loudness range and ignore peaks because I'm going to manage the peaks with limiting and probably won't even hit zero. So anyways, um, that's a long way of saying choose this preset and press apply. And... I might have did that while I was talking, but I'm going to undo that and show you again. Choose this preset and press apply and watch how the level changes. It changes quite a bit. And if you go to the clips tab, you'll see that the pre-gain is now plus 9.202 decibels. So in a non-destructive way, WaveLab just turned up the file 9 decibels, which doesn't really mean anything right now. But what is cool about that is it's non-destructive, meaning if you decide that Maybe it should have only gone up eight. You can just type in the box eight. You can type in the box my, uh, plus seven, whatever you want. Um, but the nice thing is it's non-destructive and it's not making duplicates of files of and more files and perhaps mangling the, the bit depth. It's just a clean way of adjusting the gain. And it's called pre-gain because this is prior to any um, plugins. Um, for those that are new to WaveLab, there are are three places to insert plugins in the montage. There's right on the clip, which is what I'm going to start with. There's right on the track, which is this montage track, which I'm not going to use. And there's the whole montage out, but this is kind of like your master fader of the montage. So I, this is where I might put a final limiter, true peak limiter, dithering, anything that you want to affect the whole montage and it's last in the chain. But we're going to start with clip effects, but what I was saying is um, pre and post refers to um, pre clip of pre clip effects or post clip effects. And for me, I like to do my gain changes pre clip effects. Now, if you've dialed in some compressor and uh, deesser and dynamics based processors, but then you still want to adjust the gain, you may want to choose post gain because then it will happen after that, and you won't be sending more or less signal into your dynamics processors, which will of course change things. So, but by default it's pre-gain. So for me, this is a great starting point. Um, if I play the file, you know, this is an interesting track. It's, it goes from quiet to loud quite a lot. Um, but all this means is that the loudest part of the song is kind of in a great spot for my plugin chain that I've, I've kind of curated. Um, 
And again, it's just something that I like. You should make up something that you like that works for you. But what I did, I think I subconsciously did this, but you could do it. Take a great mix that you've worked on that didn't need much work, you know, a really outstanding sounding mix. And um, you could just do what I did, normalize it to a certain level. And then you could do what I'm about to show you, you know, add some plugins that you like, an EQ, whatever, um, a compressor that you like with, with a certain amount of makeup gain that gets you to perhaps, you know, minus 12 LUFS, um, whatever you like to do. And then, then you kind of know that when you've normalized the file to this level, then you've added uh, a known plugin chain that you like to start with. Then you know that you're getting close to perhaps your final level. And then you can even have a preset chain for your output with a limiter that adds a couple more, um, a little more loudness. And then you're getting into the minus 10, minus 9 range. And I think for a lot of people, that's where we're doing a lot of modern music. Of course, there's extremes and exceptions. But, you know, figure out what works for you. But my, my whole point here is kind of decide what you kind of step back and figure out, you know, what are you always doing and how can I make my life simpler by normalizing the file first and then having a clip effects chain that gets me to um, uh, close to where I want to go and then have an output effects chain that, that, with a limiter that takes you to where you often go. And then, of course, fine tune it per project. But what I'm about to show you here is I'm going to load a common clip effects chain that I like to use. I mean, of course, WaveLab comes with the master rig, um, Steinberg's master rig. And this is a very modular plugin that has EQ, compressor, compressor, an imager, some saturation. You know, a lot of modules can be loaded here. Um, so you can, it's basically like a pl plugins within a plugin. Um, so this is great. Um, a lot of great sounding tools in here. Um, my kind of starting point clip effects for most modern music um, I'll show it to you there's a shortcut of course but if you go to menu um, load plugin chains you can also click this folder to load a plugin chain so there I've just inserted a bunch of plugins um, they're not all active so I know that looks like a lot but they're either not active or not doing anything yet but it's a good broad set of tools that I like to have um, you can shortcut it but i can just press the letter f i should i should step back um, the letter c will choose the clip effects window the letter f will bring up the preset menu and i can choose this particular one that i like and you'll notice that when i play it now it is kind of like i mentioned it's in that minus 13 range which bumps it up a little more um, i really enjoy this particular um, compressor plugin and as you can see I have the threshold already set so that it's just starting to do a little gain reduction on the louder this is a very um, kind of a dance type song with a lot of you know per you can really see the drum hits but my threshold is already kind of set to a point where it's just starting to engage some gain reduction and you can do that with any compressor that you like to use you know once you've decided on a starting point to normalize to it's very easy to insert any compressor and decide, you know, this is where the, the threshold needs to be before it starts doing a little gain reduction. And then, of course, you can decide if you want to do too much gain reduction or perhaps none. Maybe you just like the tone of this plugin or maybe you want to catch some of the transients. And, you know, that's that's a whole other topic, but I just want to show you how to get um, the plugins inserted. Of course, um, you can insert, I believe, up to 10 plugins in the clip section. And... You know, if I wanted to add another plugin, I could just click here and choose um, any plugin that I'd like. And you can slide them around to be in any particular order. But again, you probably find that you use a lot of the same plugins um, to some degree, and you could come up with even a couple plugin chains that work for. Um, you and I, I don't believe in presets in terms of like, you always need to boost the highs and boost the lows. As you can see, my plugins are set flat, but these are kind of common frequency areas you may want to reach for, whether it's boosting or cutting. Um, 
you know, everything is set really flat. Same with this multiband compressor. It's not doing anything yet. I need to activate it, but it's at least ready to go for me in a, in a great, in a, in a good starting point. So those are clip effects. And, you know, of course you just listen and dial it in to whatever you think needs to happen. I'm not, not, not necessarily trying to teach you mastering here, but teaching how to use WaveLab efficiently. Um, and the cool thing about clip effects, especially if you're doing an album, you know, these plugins are only inserted on this clip. So let me find one with a meter. Well, it's not going to make any sense, but if there were other songs in this montage, um, they wouldn't be getting this plugin chain. This is only on the clip, and you can read here that it's this clip that it's on. Now, minus 13 is not all that loud these days. So I like to also, of course, add a digital limiter. And there's a number of ways you can do that. Of course, you can go to the output section and you can click in this area and choose a limiter of your choice. I'm a bit of a creature of habit, so I like I have a couple limiters that I like, depending on the style of music and what it sounds like and what it needs to sound like. But my point is you can load, you know, a plug-in chain. Sometimes I'll use the inflator before my final limiter. And as you can see, the limiter is only doing one decibel, you know, it's only increasing the level by a dB. Um, and it's set to the output ceiling I like these days, which is minus 0 0.5, followed by a true peak limiter. I like this true peak limiter because it has the delta mode, and I can hear if and when it's engaging, if, you know, if, and just hear the true peaks that it's catching. Um, I can demonstrate that by going extreme here. Now you can see, well, if I just lower this a hair, you'll really see it. You can see the true peak limiter engaging, and of course you can d determine how to address that if, if it's good, bad, indifferent. But anyways, you can very quickly load a great starting point for your final limiter to kind of do your final level push. You know, it, it was, this song was about minus 13 LUFS before I added this, and then I could, you know, use some inflator level boost. I can use a limiter to get some more loudness. Now I have no idea if this sounds good, but um, you get the point of how to do it. And then you can just kind of determine how, how it sounds. And you know, if, if it's starting to sound a little over limited, then of course go back to your clip effects and maybe carve out some low end so you can push it a little louder. Um, you know, I don't want to necessarily tell you how to master or teach you how to do mastering, but um, this is a really common, uh, plug-in scenario for me. And the great thing about this is it's all saved in the audio montage. So I can close this and then reopen it. And everything is still there in the inspector just as I left it, as opposed to doing it in the audio editor where you have to save and load this um, separately. I think you just really open up the chance to run into problems. If you forget to save it, if, if you forget to load it, if that file goes to a strange folder and then it's gone um, someday. So the great thing about this workflow is everything is saved within that um, montage file, which is of course right here. It's grown to about 26 kilobytes, again, very small. Um, this data folder was just when I did the sample rate conversion. So you probably noticed that I haven't added a dither plugin. And that's because I like to dither um, I like to render everything first and lock in the processing. Comes in a little more handy for albums, EPs, but also very useful for singles because basically I want to render and bake in or lock in this processing, you know, at the native sample rate and highest bit depth that the um, WaveLab engine is working at. So, uh, for example, there's the bit depth meter here you can see that it's working at 64-bit floating point. Now the file itself came in at 32-bit floating point. If the file came in at 24-bit, it would just be displaying 24 bits or 16. Um, but the moment you do any processing, you know, for example, for example, I'm gonna load in a 24-bit file that has already been mastered, but doesn't matter. I'm going to open it in a montage. 
I need to load in a 96k file for my sound card purposes. Bear with me here. So let's say I have this 24-bit file. Some, a lot of files come in at 24-bit. That's just fine. As soon as you do anything like a gain change, watch how the bit depth increases the 64-bit floating point. Um, if I reset that, back to 24-bit. So anything we're doing is happening in floating point, basically, in the montage, which is normal in how most programs work these days. Point being, I don't want to commit to anything less than the full resolution of this file. So let's say I'm happy with how this sounds. And now another thing that um, I, I find myself doing a lot of mastering is automation. Um, it's kind of, I think it's not talked about a whole lot. Um, but another benefit to working in the montage is we have clip gain envelope right here. So let's say anything can, let's say we want this first downbeat to hit a little harder. We can raise the first downbeat a, a decibel. You know, I've done that a couple times. I've turned up the opening drum fill of songs. Let's say, um, well, let's just say this is a drum fill instead of whatever it is. You know, you can section it off and you can turn up if it's just, in, you know, makes the intro a little more exciting and grab you. Um, I've had bridges that get too quiet and I'm being a little careless here, but you get the idea, you know, you, maybe you want to make the bridge get less quiet. Um, anything can happen. Um, I've also had cases where the ver maybe I want the verse, let's say this is a verse of a song and I want it to actually get quieter. Um, you know, I can section it off and I can actually turn it down and that maybe helps it relax a little bit um, and not, not feel as loud. It gives the chorus somewhere to go. So we can do all sorts of level automation and this is all happening by default it's happening before your clip effects if you go to the envelope tab you can turn on envelope after effects so let's say you wanted the, these level changes to happen after the clip effects but they're always going to happen before the output effects like the limiter but if you want them to happen after the clip effects you can select this box but i i tend to keep it in this mode where it's happening before the um, clip effects. There's no, there's no right or wrong, but point being, let's say, you know, that's just one little thing I just randomly thought of and wanted to show you. I, I do a fair amount of level automation, maybe not as extreme as this demonstration, but it is possible. And it's something that's great about the montage. So let's say I'm happy with how this sounds and I want to send it to the client that, um, you know, you can, take from it what you want and leave what you don't want. But for me, this lets me render all types of formats. I can render a 24 bit 96 K wave, 24 bit 48 K 24 bit 44 one 16 bit 44 one and uh, reference MP3. And I do that. I like to render it right from the wave lab montage because then I can be sure that all the metadata is present in every file and it lets me manage the dithering. You know, I know there's batch converters, but batch converters can do weird things. They can um, add additional time to the song, to the file. If if there's a bug or a discrepancy, you can strip the file of its metadata. Um, any number of things can happen. I'm not saying batch converters are bad. I use them in a few scenarios. But when I'm rendering my master files to send out, I like to render them from the... Um, wave lab montage specifically that just helps um, me ensure all the metadata is there and that what I'm seeing is what I'm rendering and there's no surprises. Um, can a fader controller work in wave lab? I've seen people um, try to use external, you know, like a, a control surface and I've seen people say that they work. It's something I've never tried. I've never used, I don't really have a need for, you know, a, a fader in wave lab, you know, a control surface type thing. Although I've been told they can work. I just don't know much about it to, to help you out with. I'm, I guess I'm just used to using a mouse and clicking and that's my fastest way to do it. I, I mean, there's definitely no, um, automation mode, like read and write where you can have the, um, you know, in a, in a multi-track DAW, you can go into 
read or write mode for automation and there's nothing like that you definitely have to draw it in but i've for, people seem to have various uses for control surfaces and in, in wave lab but i just have never had the need so anyways let's say i'm happy with how this sounds i'm going to render it now i'm not going to render it um to a lower resolution yet i have a preset here called um initial 6496 render and all that means is and it's I should probably rename that. It doesn't even mean it's going to be 96K. What it means is it's going to be 64-bit floating point to keep the precision, um, and it's going to be the same sample rate as whatever the montage is. So if I were at 88.2, which happens sometimes, or 192, um, it's not going to change. I should rename this, but basically this is the, the render. When I do my first render, when I'm done, I always use this one. This one could probably get deleted because it was... Um, for a different type of workflow. So right here, um, and what th what these render presets do is t it takes all these settings and remembers them because there's a lot of settings. You know, there's naming scheme, there's the format, there's what are you rendering. Um, so it takes time to set all these how you want them, and the render presets just make a very quick work of that. So um, I choose this um, second option here, and I do have to tell it a few things. I have to tell it... Um, where I want it to go and what I want it to be called. So first thing I like to do is tell it where I want it to go. Um, so I'm going to click on this folder and I'm going to select the destination folder and I can quickly navigate to where I'm working. Um, I have a little extension called default folder X that helps me get places even faster, but I'm, I'm going to put it in the, you know, this, this song is called cold new single. Um, and I'm just going to make a new folder called 96K Renders. Again, going to have a lot of shortcuts for these things that I type over and over every day. Um, you can adapt what I'm doing to how you prefer to work. But I just have a folder called 96K Renders. And what this is going to be is now it's a little bit, I don't want to say redundant, but it seems silly now because it's just one file, one song. But I'm going to render this whole montage and lock in that processing. And I need to call it something. And I usually do some kind of variation on the artist name. This is what I really like about WaveLab is you can copy and paste stuff. Maybe I'd call this um, CNS as an abbreviation and version one, because you know if we have to do a revision, I'm gonna call it version two. Uh, we'll get to revisions later as well. So basically, I'm gonna render this whole montage to this folder with these settings. And you can press the start rendering button or you can press command return and it looks like it's going to take a moment i'm just going to leave it leave it go and talk about some other things while it renders um see if there's any questions yeah there is a question reference track thanks for reminding me i was going to talk about reference tracks um in fact i'm going to stop the rendering process so reference tracks are new to wave lab 10 really really powerful it's something that I would probably do earlier on and I just um, forgot to do it, but I'm going to reset this automation. I'm going to actually, um, I'll keep that there. So reference tracks, um, you can press the plus sign and create a reference track. I've programmed a shortcut, control option, command and the letter R. And now we have a reference track and reference tracks are good as I showed you last month for you can send audio to a hardware output to your analog chain. But really, I think the intention was um, the intention was for comp comparison. So a, a cool feature here is, you know, I've loaded in the main song. I can right click on the track header and I can choose copy clips to track. And you can do this to any, if there was a regular track, you could copy it to a regular track, but I'm going to copy this clip to the reference track and it's asking me if I want to do all clips or selected. Well, there there's only one clip, so it's the same difference. Um, and now I have a copy of this song on a reference track. And the reason why I should have done this sooner is because it does copy the clip effects. And for the demonstration that I'm showing you now, I wouldn't want to hear those effects. I want to hear what the song originally sounded like which means perhaps you, you may or may not want to set this to zero dB to hear where it started from. So that's, that's the original file. 
and it's perfectly in sync, as you can see. Um, there's two ways to use reference tracks. Um, you can just press the ear button, and now I would be hearing the um, the version on the reference track. So that's how it originally sounded, is you know much quieter. Um, if you where is that setting? If you click on this icon here and choose Master Section Playback Processing, then any external metering that you have, including the WaveLab metering, is going to reflect the reference track. So you can see now it's reading minus 26 because it's pretty quiet. If I uncheck that, put it that way, now the reference track meter, uh, the reference track um, let's see here. Well, basically, you have this option here of if you want the reference track to be to influence the metering or not. And right now it is influencing the metering. So point being, you can listen to it by pressing the ear. So now I'm hearing the bottom track, how it originally sounded, and I can compare. Now, of course, it can be very different levels. And I'll talk about that in a second. But with a reference track, you can also route it to another hardware output. So for me, I have a nice monitor controller. So I could route this to the raw output, which I've configured. And audio connections. I have a bunch of um, playback paths. So my raw output is AES 9 and 10. It's feeding my monitor controller an alternate not the one I would listen to when I'm mastering, but it's feeding a different AES input. And this would allow me to just play it and toggle on my monitor controller if I'm hearing the work I'm doing in WaveLab or am I hearing the bottom track, the untouched version. And I can compare and see if what I'm doing is hopefully making it better. Now, there is, of course, a level difference. The master section has a thing called um, Smart Bypass that lets you um, do a more level matched AB comparison, but I guess one quirk of working in the montage is we don't get that, but there's a, a plugin by Ian Shepard, mastering engineer called perception. And you could probably configure a way to load in perception so that when you're a being, um, the unmastered version and the master that they're the same level, um, because of my gain structure, I actually have, it's a long story, but I don't need to use any level matching because I have it level matched uh, within my gain structure and my monitor controller. It's not perfect, but it's close enough for me that it's for me that works very well. But basically, the whole point of a reference track is to be able to compare what you are doing to how it started. Um, and this could also be a different song. If 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 a client sends you a file of a different song they like the tone of, you could load that on this track, and you can A B or it could be a different song of theirs you mastered. Um, a while ago, it could be a previous version of a song. You know, maybe you're doing version two now and you're comparing to see if you are making the right changes. So reference tracks are great. Um, the, the, the workflow I'm showing you is only for in the box. When I'm using analog gear, I separate out the processes. Um, I like to have a, a montage where I'm just playing and capturing making kind of a mess, and then when I have everything captured and sounding good, I'll create a master file that I load into the montage for you know final assembly, tweaks, and stuff like that. Um, because the, the new analog stuff is so new to WaveLab 10, I haven't, I haven't really felt the need or had the time to create a workflow that combines those two. I, I like to keep them separate anyways because the analog process can get a little messy with revisions and... and um, spectral repair and stuff like that. I like my montages to just be clean single files. Another question is how do you make the volume automation dots in the montage? Um, you, you just double click right on the envelope. It, it's kind of hard to see that there's an envelope. It looks like it's just the middle of the waveform, but there is an envelope there that you can, you know, of course, turn up and down. I tend to, you know, when I first started using WaveLab, I would use this envelope a lot to like fine-tune the level before I get started. But then I discovered the meta normalizer that I showed you, and now I just use the 
volume line for automation type stuff. Um, so if you go to envelope, um, you, you can hide the, so perhaps yours is hidden, or you can show the volume envelope or the panning envelope if you want to pan. If for some reason you want to pan the intro um, to the right, I'm holding the command key to just change that section. Um, if you wanted to do some weird panning, you certainly could. Um, but yeah, you go to envelope, volume, and then you just double click to make the dots. If you don't press any keys, it's going to do the whole song. If you hold command, it will just do that section. Um, so that's kind of handy, um, the command key. Or holding option. Yeah, so there's some modifier keys that you can use to do specifically what you want. But hopefully that helps answer that question about how to make the points. I'm going to reset them except for I need to get my fades back. So I got a little off track with the reference tracks, but they are a really important, great new part about Wave Lab. The other cool thing with reference tracks is there's no danger of them being part of your rendered audio. So you don't have to worry about muting it or disabling it or deleting it. If you see a track with an R, that's a reference track, there's literally no way that I can think of, unless you solo it before rendering that, it's going to get the audio is going to be in your um, render pass. So it's kind of a safe, it's a nice safe way to work where it's just there if you want to reference it. What's also great is it's not, when you run the CD wizard, it's not um, included in any markers that get added. So let's say you have a bunch of reference tracks, a bunch of clips on your reference track. The CD wizard isn't going to consider them real songs and make a marker for them. They're just kind of there. So reference tracks are, really useful in that regard. It just kind of stays out of the way. Um, I can keep the reference track in here because it, it really doesn't matter, but I wanted to show you. Um, so I got off track, but I made a folder called 96K Renders, and I, I want to name the file something that makes sense to me. This isn't what the client is going to see yet. This is just internal reference for me. I like to have a naming scheme so I know what I'm doing. So I'm going to render that file. It's going to take a moment, but I can talk about some other things. So I'm going to render the file, and this is just locking in the processing at the native um, bit sample rate and bit depth of the processing, and then we're going to go down from there, rendering each format. You know, from uh, we're going to use the custom montage duplicate, which you know this video has been going on almost an hour. This all happens really, really fast once you get the shortcuts down and get a workflow that works for you. And I'm not by any means saying you should just use presets and not listen. Of course, you have to listen. I'm just, after years of doing this, I've decided that if the clip is normalized to a certain um, loudness, that's the loudest part of the song, you know, then from there I can take a few, uh, make a nice gain stage and that's going to get me, you know, 80% of where I normally go. Of course, it depends if it's traditional jazz, classical, or like a rock or pop album. You got to use your instincts but for most modern music where we're trying to go as loud as we can before it sounds bad you know this kind of works for for me so this is almost done rendering and the master section of course has um the resampler i really haven't gotten into using the resampler of wave lab and part of that's because i'm a creature of habit um, prior to wave lab nine i think it, there was something called the crystal resampler and it to be honest, it wasn't the greatest sounding sample rate conversion. So I was using an external software for that, and I still use external software. The um, The algorithm that it uses now is called SOX. I believe it's open source or something along those lines, and it actually sounds quite good. It's one of the best out there. It's right up there with Seracon and RX in terms of quality, and I could probably use that and be just fine. You know, WaveLab has a batch processor, but I just have, I'm just kind of stuck in my habits. Um, but I don't like to use the resampler because I think that's asking a lot. You never know if a plugin is going to have a problem with the resampler. And it gets to be a lot to manage. Plus, after you resample, you have to add a dither plugin. And the only place you can add a dither plugin is in the master section. And now you're in that same problem of all your settings are not being saved 
with the montage, and I just have a really hard time with that. So I'm going to rename. I have, again, the stream deck going to do the work for me um, while I talk, but I'm going to rename this resulting montage something very similar, but it's going to tell it to be 2496. And what the stream deck does for me is calls up, again, the plugin preset window. I'm just going to add a 24-bit dither plugin. So right now, the only plugin happening is this 24-bit dithering plugin. And the reason I know it's 24-bit is I've set it that way. I have one for 16 as well. Um, so one of the settings I didn't show you is that when I render, I want it to create an audio montage from the results. So that's what it did. It created a new montage for me. I named it. I took the dash out of the name because this is no longer the master montage with all the plugins. It's just everything's baked in except for the dither. Now, one little, um, it's definitely not a problem, but one quirk of my rendering workflow, which is worth dealing with, is that when you use this, um, you know what? I apologize for the uh, backtracking, but we also need to um, enter in the CD text. And you're probably wondering, why do we need CD text? Because we're not making CDs, right? Well, we need CD text for metadata purposes if you want metadata in your files. So um, I have a little shortcut here that copies the name of the montage, which again is nicely named with the artist name and the song title for me. And then we can call up the CD text window. CD functions edit CD text is the slow way. Shift T is the fast way. Um, or my really fast way with the stream deck is called CD text start. So what it does is it copies the montage name and opens up the CD text editor. And from there I can just arrange it how I need to. Uh, that's the name of the title. That's the name of the artist. I can press this button here to populate the artist name over to the song, because right now this is just the project. And I can press this button to populate. This grabs the marker name, which is perfectly named, and it puts it to the um, song title. And I know this is the CD text area, but um, this is all going to come in handy with metadata. And if you're doing ISRC codes, you could, um, wherever you get the code from, I have a spreadsheet if I'm generating them. Sometimes the client sends it to you. Um, if you're just doing a single, it's probably fastest to just go to the CD tab and click in there and paste it. If you're doing an album, you can, of course, call up the CD wizard. And I have a preset for ISRC only. And the reason I have this is because I don't want it to generate markers anymore. I've already got my markers. I don't want to do anything except add ISRC code. So you could paste it there, particularly if you're doing an EP or an album, because then it's going to increment the code from up from there, which is usually, but not always what you want. So there's a number of ways to add the ISRC code. So I'm going to redo this render. Um, I apologize for having to double back. Um, just when I'm in my normal workflow, this is all second nature, but when I'm putting on a presentation, sometimes you forget things. So now I'm going to render, but what I was going to say is this rendering process is great, but one little quirk is that, um, it does because I've created this um, cue sheet, I don't need a cue sheet myself, of course, but WaveLab does, because what, what's going to happen here is it's going to um, populate all the information I've entered to the new montage when it when the rendering is done. So it, it, it uses this cue sheet to take the information, the marker, the CD text from the source montage, and populate it to the resulting montage. And the only minor little hiccup with that is that it does quantize the markers to the nearest CD frame. So for a single song, probably not a big deal. For a C for an EP or an album, it's not a big deal for me because I already want the markers quantized. Even if it's not going to CD, um, I'm a fan of quantizing the markers because at some point they could press CDs. At some point, somebody could burn a CD from who knows what. I'm a fan of quantizing the markers to the nearest CD frame. In album context, ha the setting just has a minor quirk. Mostly when you're doing singles that 
where you're doing instrumental and TV mix and you want them all to be the same precise length. I'll sh when I get done with this, I'm going to redo all this much faster and show you how to do it with instrumentals and keep it all the same. But I just wanted to point out that um, after this gets named, I'm going to show you that the marker time, the, the end marker is going to have shifted by a very tiny amount, not even worth mentioning in this phase, because to me it doesn't matter, but in the source montage, you can see that this song is three minutes, 56 seconds, and 247 milliseconds. In the resulting one, it's the same length, but 253 milliseconds. That's because this last marker quantized to the nearest CD frame. And for, in my opinion, for a single, not a huge deal, um, because you've already, I've already greatly modified the length anyways, so it's not going to be a big deal. The only time it matters is if you're doing TV, instrumental, main mix, and you want them to be the exact pr precise um, down to the millisecond, then you may want to do what I'll show you in the next step. But I just wanted to point out that that happens. Uh, not a big deal. So now I've got a 96K montage. And I've inserted the 24-bit dither. That's why I'm calling this one 2496. As I mentioned at the start, the montages themselves are bit depth agnostic. They don't have a bit depth. They just process audio. Um, but the reason I call it 2496 is because I have this 24-bit dither inserted, and that's what I'm going to render. It's a 24-bit 96K file. So let's talk about actually rendering the files. And the cool thing here is if I go to the CD tab, you can see that it still has the CD text information, which is going to get transposed into metadata when I render this file. So what I do now when I'm not talking is I open up the presets tab and I can just press the number nine. One cool thing about all these presets, you'll notice there's a little line underneath some of the characters. This is new to me because I'm not a Windows person, but apparently it's a Windows thing. If I just press the nine, that preset's going to get chosen. So if I'm going to render it, this is for single songs now, if I'm going to render a 24-bit 96K wave from this montage, I can just go to presets, press the letter 9, sorry, the number 9, and what that does is it's going to render the CD track. Now let me zoom in on the start of this. This goes back to earlier in the video, but see how there's a nice little buffer here, about 200 milliseconds before the first downbeat? I think that's a good thing. If you're doing library samples, maybe that's not, you don't want to add that, but for most music, I think it's good. Um, so my point here is it's going to render from marker to marker, and it adds in this little, as you can see, it's digital silence. There's no absolutely no sound there. It's just a nice little buffer, and it's going to render to this marker here, which we've already faded out. Anyways, but the other cool thing is it's going to, of course, be a 24-bit wave instead of something else. And it's going to add, where it says scheme, it's going to add an underscore and 2496 to the file. And that's just an easy way to tell that it's what format it is. So the last thing we need to do is tell it where to go. I don't want it to go to this folder. That makes no sense. So I'm going to go to the Files tab, which is Command-F, or just click on it. I'm going to copy this name that I created, because I like to have some some sort of naming scheme for projects as you get to version one, version two, this comes in handy, especially if you're doing mastering all day. You want to have some kind of naming scheme that works for you, and this works for me. I'm going to copy that name that I came up with for this project and paste it right here, delete the dot wave. Um, so one great thing about WaveLab is you can, this folder doesn't exist yet, but I like how you can manually um, get it set up to be created. So location, as soon as I hit render, this folder is going to get created and then a file is going to get put in that folder and it's going to be named a certain way. I'll show you in a second. And the cool thing here is that the renders go very fast because all the processing is baked in. So the only plugin running is the, the dithering plugin and that goes very fast. So now in my folder, which I'm starting to fill up, I have one file, 24 bit 96 K. Um, but I like to send people a lot of different formats. And as I mentioned, I'm just kind of in the habit of using RX still for sample rate conversion. There's no right or wrong. Um, it's just what I like to use. The batch processor of WaveLab would serve equally well. I just 
haven't um, mastered it yet. So I'm going to take that. Now I'm not going to take the 2496 file because that's already been dithered to 24 bit. I'm going to go back to the 96K render, which as you can see is um, floating point and 96K sample rate. I'm going to take that file and I have a preset in RX and I'm going to make another folder called 48K renders and I'm going to convert that one down to 48K. And I'm going to do one more conversion yet before I get back to WaveLab. I'm also going to convert the source, the main master render to 44.1 sample rate and put that in its own folder. And the reason I'm putting them in their own folders is because um, files, of course, can't have the same name in the same folder. The computer doesn't like that. But we're going to use the custom montage duplicate feature to get down to all these sample rates. So, um, Again, I use the Stream Deck as a shortcut, but what I'm going to do is tell WaveLab to recreate this montage using a new file, the 48K version. So the slow way is File, New, Audio Montage, From Current File, um, Customize Duplicate. Um, and you press create and then it's going to ask you where is the new file and you navigate to the whatever you want to recreate but I'm going to navigate to the 48k folder and now it's made a montage for me but I'm going to undo that because you can get there faster um, and there's two things you need to do here again you need to copy the, I like to copy the name of the montage because it comes in handy for naming the new one for me it's um, control and the letter N to copy the name and then it, with my settings, it's command and forward slash to bring up this menu. But if you watch, I can do it very qu quickly with the Stream Deck. I can just press one button right now, it copies it, and it opens that prompt for me. So it's kind of like stacking up your shortcuts. And of course, you navigate to the 48K folder. And now it's just recreated the montage with all the markers, all the data. But if you look at the bottom, it's at 48K sample rate. So, of course, I need to save it. So I press Command-S to bring up the save prompt, and then I paste the name that I've copied, and I just change this to 2448. And the dither is already set to 24-bit, but if you look at the um, folders, you can see that here's the file that I downsampled, and then here's the, the montage that I just created. Now, downsampling... Or resampling in general, that, that can change the peak level a little bit, and I don't. It depends kind of how loud you've pushed the file, and a number of things. But there could be over. Even though I had a limiter at minus 0.5, the downsampled versions could have. They're definitely going to have peak closer to zero, but they could even be over zero. So we can open this file in the audio editor to analyze that. And I just did it the fast way to show you, and I can see that the peak levels didn't really increase very much. So I'm, comfor I'm comfortable with this, um, with not touching it. The slow way to do that would be to press Command E to edit, bring it in the audio editor, um, Shift Y to bring up the global analysis window, and then you press Analyze. You can see all sorts of loudness. I can look at the average loudness in LUFS, RMS loudness, peak loudness, um, for this case, I'm just making sure the peaks didn't somehow get at or above zero when I resampled it. And again, the fast play with the Stream Deck, I just have a little command that op does all that in one command for me. It's very quick. Anyway, so we're, we're clear to render this. So I'm going to go back to the presets and press the letter 8. And what that's going to do is add a 2448 um, at the end of the file. So I'm going to render it to the same location. This is what I'm going to send my client. And that's going to kind of make sense to them as a folder name. So now what we have in this folder is two files, and they're named kind of appropriately, the, the song title, and the uh, it designates what the bit depth and sample rate of the file. There's also metadata in these files, which I'll show you once I get all of them rendered. So now that the 48K version is rendered, I can do those same steps, but 
creating the montage at 44.1, saving it, of course. And this all happens much faster when you're not talking. Um, and then for some reason, it's the letter N. That adds a 2444 suffix to the file. I'm going to press Shift S to save as, change this to 1644, and load the 16 bit dither. And this naming scheme, which is 1644, I know I'm going a little fast. I have to rewind it, but now I'm going to render the 16 bit 44 1 version. And then lastly, I'm going to render the MP3. Um, and for the MP3, we can add the artwork. We, we can add artwork to WAV files too, but very few programs will display artwork in WAV files. And perhaps it could even cause a problem with some distributors. I, I'm not really sure. I tend to not add artwork to the WAV files unless the client really specifies it. If they're kind of an audio file, there's a program called J River Media Center that will display artwork in WAV files, but iTunes and Windows Media Player definitely don't. So I tend to only put the MP3, the artwork in the MP3 file, which I'm going to show you. Um, so to do that, we go to metadata and press edit and the, go to the picture tab. It's in ID3 picture and I can press the plus sign and I can navigate to the artwork, which is usually in the original files. And there's the artwork. And then lastly, we need to just choose the preset. 320 mp3 single and that's important if i choose the tracks preset that's going to put a numeric prefix at the start which this is a single so there is the only it doesn't need a numeric prefix in my opinion so i go to mp3 single and render that now i've got a nice collection of files all of various sample rates of course you want to listen to these and make sure there's no errors, but if, if any errors are going to happen, it's going to be in this first render, and then it's going to be present in all your files, which would be bad. You know, That's kind of why I like to get the main render done first, analyze it, um, it's because that's if any errors are going to happen, it's probably going to be there. It could be a click at the start of the file or a plugin that's gone rogue. So anyways, I have a nice collection of five files here. I got this 16-bit 44 OneWave. 20 bit, 24 bit 44 1, 24 bit 48, 24 bit 96K, and the MP3. And if I load this in, I'm going to use a third party app here to just show you what's there. As you can see, there's a bunch of metadata in, this, in these files. You can see the ISRC code, the album name, the artist name, the song title, the year, anything you kind of want. I'll do a separate metadata. Um, episode here, but I just wanted to show you that these files do have metadata, including the artwork in the MP3. So if your client loads this into their iTunes, they're going to see the artwork and it's going to look pretty legit, like a real release. Everything's cleanly named. Um, and I think that's great. Um, so I'm going to get out of this program. Um, so from there, from that point, you could just send these to your client, however you prefer to send files. Um, I have a little ex ex explanation sheet of what each format is and what you should use it for, um, uh, email template, which is nice, you know, because some digital distributors are still stuck on using 16-bit 44.1 files, whereas DistroKid, for example, can accept 24-bit and higher sample rates. And as we learned this week, Spotify is going to have high-res streaming. So if if Spotify has received, we don't know we don't know how high-res it's going to be, but let's take Amazon for example. If Amazon gets a 24-bit 96K wave from the distributor, you, as the listener, have an option to stream that if you have Amazon HD. So I like to provide my clients with all the options um, and then let them be aware of what to use it for. You know, 48K is common in the video world, um, and MP3s are good for reference. Um, for I like to just send all these out and explain what they're for. So back to WaveLab, we're done. Now we do end up with... This is what the folder ends up looking like. We have, um, you know, the folder of master files I rendered, the original files folder, which is only has the artwork, the original file, and the first montage, um, and then my render folders. And the, the main reason I have separate folders for all these renders is, again, 
check out the file name. It's the same file name, so I have to have them in their own folder. Now let's say the client says, I love it, but can you make it louder? Because that's what happens in the mastering world. You could open up the montage and do Shift S, and I like to just save it as version two, because you always want to be able to get back to version one. Because if you send version two, they might say, okay, can you split the difference between version one and two? And if you don't have an exact way of opening what your settings were, then you're kind of guessing, and that's never good. So let's say the client you know, says, can you make it a little louder? I would open up the montage, save it as version two, then dig into my plugins and say, okay, what do I need to do? Do they ask for more bass? You know, I can add some more bass. You know, do they ask for, um, who knows what they ask for, but whatever you need to do, you do it, um, make it louder. Um, I think my true peak limiter got taken off when I was screwing around, but um, you know, if they want it louder, you crank it way up. It's, I'm being dramatic here. I would, this is higher than I've ever set it before, but you get the idea. Do your changes and then just do the rendering process over again. Start with that 20, that 6496 um, in the 96K renders folder. What's cool about WaveLab is it knows the name. It knows that this file is in this folder, so I can just select it and change the one to a two. And now I'm starting all over again, kind of repeat the process. I'm going to repeat this process more quickly just to show you how fast it can go once, you know, once the initial render is done. I'm a fan of processing at the highest sample rate available, um, you know, rather than, so the point is this first render takes a while, but the rest of the renders go very quickly because all the processing is locked in. I'm going to answer a question, best way to render in WaveLab, uh, real-time render and offline render. Um, you know, real-time rendering, I guess you would do if you're going through analog gear, because you have to. Um, offline rendering is what I always do. And you do need to check your files, because especially if you're introducing a new plugin into your workflow, um, not all plugins are created perfectly um, for all programs. So you may find that a plugin sounds fine on playback, but when you go to render it, there's a big click at the start of it or at the end of it, there's a glitch. So you got to check your files, um, you know, make sure everything's right. Cause there's a big plugins operate differently when they're playing audio versus, you know, offline rendering. This is true for any piece of software. Um, so I always just render offline and then check it. And I stick to a core group of plugins that I trust and have tested myself. If I get a new plugin that I really like and I want to use, the first thing I do is really extensive rendering tests to make sure, A, that it's rendering and not... Um, I've had plugins that sound, that pass audio on playback, but you go to render it and they don't um, process. They just do nothing. Um, so that's bad. So you got to really test your plugins uh, before you use them. But as far as rendering, um, I'm always doing it offline. I feel like there could be a way to do real-time rendering with plugins, but I've never even um, thought about it with WaveLab. So again, it's made this new montage for me um, with the changes I've made, and I need to name it. Um, I like to use the Stream Deck to rename stuff because I'm, not that I'm lazy, but um, I like consistency. It's going to ask me, it knows that I want to add a dither plugin, so I'm going to select the 24 bit, and now we're going to do this all over again. Um, choose the 2496 single preset. The difference being, I'm going to make a version two folder. So, another thing I like about WaveLab is it can see a list of recent folders. I'm going to select the version one folder, but I'm not going to render. I'm just going to delete the one, change it to two. And now I got that. And in the meantime, I can open up RX load in the version 2 master render, set it to 48K, put it in the 48K folder, and repeat again for 44.1, and then I'll show you what we end up with. So I can flip back to WaveLab. Um, I'm doing the create customized duplicate, which I'll show you the slow way. But it's very slow. File, new, 
audio montage from current file, current file, customize, duplicate, create. Um, I haven't done that since the first time I ever did it, and then I programmed a shortcut. Again, you want to copy the name of the current montage for naming reasons. Command forward slash brings up this window, and you're just going to point it to the 48K renders folder. So now it's going to recreate the montage at 48K. So this can be done very, very fast. I know it's a lot of, it can seem like a lot of steps to do, to get to what I'm doing, but I really, um, really, really like this workflow. I can do it quite quickly um, without even thinking about it, as you can see. Save as for the 1644, load the 16-bit dither, get the right naming and render settings, MP3 single, um, shift A will bring up the metadata tab. Uh, I can find the artwork. And if I go to this folder now, I have the same thing, but version two. And you could, you know, version two in the folder name indicates that, um, but I have a cool program called the Better Finder Rename where you could load in the files. And this adds a version two to the file name. So now you can see the file name has version two. This could help clarify that which file it is if they're loading it into another piece of software because you don't want them to have files with the same name. However you want to do it, um, it's up to you. So now that's how you do a revision. Um, sometimes the revision is, hey, we sent you the wrong mix file, so here's a new mix file. Um, WaveLab has a cool feature. So let's say um, I sent them version 2, but they said, man, we really just need to turn the vocals up. That's the problem. So I would save as version three. And if they sent me a new mix, I guess I need to create one. Let me just duplicate that. That's gonna be my pretend vocal up version that they sent. Um, I could. I wanna save the montage as version three because they always, I always wanna be able to get back to what I did in case there's any questions splitting the difference. Or sometimes it happens we're like, oh, we are wrong. We really love version one, let's go with that. Well. If you didn't do a save as, you don't know exactly what version one was. So anyways, let's say they send a new file. Now you don't have to recreate the montage over again. All you have to do is go to, I have it as a shortcut, which is um, command R, but I believe it's, um, yeah, you go to the insert tab, replace audio file, browse, open file selector. You could go to wherever the new file is located. And that's gonna load in, now there's nothing changing because it's technically the same file, but that's how you could load in a new version of a mix that they send you without having to recreate all the stuff you did. It's very fast. Now hopefully they're uh, um, awesome and that their bounces start from the same spot, but sometimes you have to readjust the timing of the file if their bounce starts a little later. Uh, those things happen, but the point is WaveLab does let you um, insert a new file, a new source file if the client sends you a new mix. So that's a pretty cool feature. Um, so um, that's basically how I master a single song in WaveLab. I can do it you know, rather quickly. And I don't mean to sound like I rush the mastering process, but getting it all set up and exported quickly helps me spend more t time and, and, and put more bandwidth on like what it actually sounds like. You know, I don't have to... I'm not wrestling with settings and exporting and file management. It's all pretty automatic once you come up with the system that works for you. Um, and that's the system that I've come up with. And I know it can seem a little redundant that I have all these montages, but I like to know, you know, what dither settings did I use for version two? And I can just open that. Whereas if you're using the master section, again, it just, it's too convoluted for me. I don't, I don't care for it. So I like and these montage files are very small, so it's not taking up a lot of space. A montage is 86 kilobytes, so not a big deal. Um, and again, by um, rendering directly from the montage, we can be confident that all the metadata is there um, in the file. Um, now, when it comes to metadata, of course, you know the digital distributors like CD Baby, DistroKid, they do not read this metadata, but there are advantages to having the metadata in the file. You know, it could be good for future proofing. 
It could be good for if you're using your music to send to a licensing agency. You know, sometimes they they have certain software. A popular one is called SoundMiner. And if they load in some WAV files and there's metadata, they can see all that. I mean, it's iTunes is a bit of a joke when it comes to metadata and WAV files, but any music supervisor is going to be able to extract any embedded metadata. So I do think there's value in having metadata. I'm a big proponent of getting the correct information up front before I start a project. It's not too hard to ask a client, you know, what is this song actually called? What is your band actually called? Is it uppercase, lowercase? Just send me the details. It's pretty easy. Then all that stuff is nicely embedded and it shows up in many places. So there's an advantage even though if you're strictly talking about a streaming service release, it's correct that CD Baby, DistroKid, they do not um, look at that metadata. You have to enter it manually, but there's plenty of advantages to getting the metadata in the files for other reasons. I'm a fan of doing it if, if I have it, so um, that's that. Um, so I'm going to recreate this now and try to go a little faster, but show you what it's like dealing with instrumental versions. When it comes to albums and EPs, I handle instrumental versions differently. Once the album is approved, then I do a save as and branch off and call it instrumental somewhere in the montage title. And I replace the clips like I showed you um, with instrumental versions because usually they're very similar sounding but without the vocals. And I work that way. When it comes to singles, I tackle the main version and the instrumental at the same time because... You know, to be honest, usually singles get approved on version one and then they just have everything and it's done. Whereas albums can be a little more involved and I wait until it's approved to provide the instrumental. So let's pretend I'm mastering um, a single song and the instrumental. And it's one of those cases where, I guess, check this out. Um, some Sometimes I get files, a, a mix and instrumental and they're totally different lengths. And I can tell that when they were bounced, you know, somebody wasn't careful. And, and if that's the case, I don't stress about it too much. But um, this song that I received to master, and I'll explain why it looks super loud in a moment, but the length, they're the exact same length down to the millisecond. Or they were. Okay, well, let's pretend they are. Something must have changed. But I want to preserve the... I want the songs to be the same length um, when, I, when I render them, when I, when I provide the files. So um, here's how I, I manage that. I, again, I make a new montage. I do Command-I. And I'm going to import these into a montage. And you can choose the order. I, I, I of course, put the... Um, the main version first and the instrumental second. And I choose I choose the first option because they can be on the same track. In fact, I have a nice little new thing that I do that helps with that. I don't stagger them. And here they are. Now, they look really loud. I'm going to explain that in a minute. It's kind of for dramatic effect. And just ignore me for a second while I correct the timing on these. So you didn't see that. Um, so these clips are the same length, and that's how a lot of times songs come in. I got I work with a lot of mix engineers that are really detailed, and the instrumental version and the main are the exact same length down to the millisecond, and I want to preserve that. Um, so the, the way we do that, and it's interesting, and I purposely made these files really loud and floating. I'm going to demonstrate something else, so just ignore the fact that they're super loud. Um, One cool thing that, about WaveLab is if, if you hold down the Option key, you can edit multiple clips at the same time. So as you can see, I've got both versions selected. I'm holding Option, and now I can edit the heads or the tails, even the fades. So that's really handy for keeping things um, consistent. Now let me, again, pretend you didn't see this. They're the same length, and we're going to keep them the same length throughout the process. So I'm going to press Command-S to save this. 
This is the same band, but this is a hot new single. So I'm just going to get the montage named. And like I mentioned, it um, it knows that I want to save it in the same file and in, in the same folder as the original files. You can change that, but for me, it doesn't make sense to change it. I want the montage to live right next to the files that are in the montage. So now I've saved it. Now I'm going to do a little arranging here. This song has a little bit of something before the first note. And let's say I listen to that and decide it's like some rustling, something that we didn't really want in the master after all. So what I can do is I want to trim that off. I do need to make sure that I press Command A so that um, selects all the files in the montage. It's a little weird because you're not going to, you have to zoom in so close that you're not going to be able to see it. You just have to trust the process. But if you press Command A, hold Option, and edit the start of the file, you can go to the um, instrumental and see that it's been trimmed up the same amount. Um, so by holding Option, I just trimmed up the, the start of the file exactly the same on both versions. And I'm going to do the same for the end of the file. Let's say I listen to this and decide we need to kind of taper the fade out to look like this. Now you can see if you have the clips tab, these clips are still the exact same length. So I edited, I was editing the main version, but because I had them both selected and held the option key, my edits were mirrored to the instrumental version. So now, so far, so good. You know, these are still the same length. Um, and then back to what I did earlier, I want to have a little bit of a buffer between the start of the track and the first note. Um, and I'm using general, I'm generalizing here. There's cases where, again, you want to, you can start it earlier if it's a really slow fade in of something. But I'm going to have the first clip start at 200 milliseconds. And I'm going to, in order for this to all work out, I need to adjust the pre-gap between the two clips. Right now, there's a lot of space between these two clips. You know, almost two seconds, or almost three seconds. Something like that. So, um, yeah, almost two seconds right here. The pre-gap will tell you that there's seconds and 200 milliseconds. So now, this is all going to make sense, I promise, because this is where the markers are going to get dropped. So the clips are the same length. Now I'm going to run the CD wizard. And as you can see, um, well, I, I made one more misstep. I forgot that I have my new singles template. So if I would have used my new singles template, the no quantize preset would have been selected, but not no big deal. I can select it now. Um, so what, what's going to happen here is it's going to create markers for each clip, but it's not going to quantize them to the CD frames. And this is important because, well, let's say I did quantize to the nearest CD frame like I do with albums. Even though the clips are the same length, check out how the markers are not the same. The track lengths are not the same. They're off by a few milliseconds. So that's not great when you're doing a single and instrumental and you want them to be the exact same length. So I'm going to go back to the CD wizard, and if I would have selected the right montage template, this would have been a little smoother, but no quantize. Now when I go to the markers tab, um, just double check something. Need to double check one more thing. What's intended to happen is the markers should be the same length apart, and they're not. So I'm going to back up and do one more thing. I'm going to try from my intended preset and just do this a little faster. Save this.
The goal here is to get the markers to be the same length. So that the tracks are the same exact length. And if they're not, I'm just going to pre um, do it another way. But in theory, this should work out. Let's see the clips. Okay, so this is not totally going according to plan here, but let's see what happens. Now the no quantize one is loaded up. Okay, I'm, I'm failing here live on YouTube, but um, maybe that's why. Um, I want this one to start at 200 milliseconds, and I want this one to be the pre-get to be 200 milliseconds. So the clips are the same length. In theory, this should work. Yep, well. Not quite sure what's going on here, so I'm going to do it. I do have a very fast way. I may have to post about what, what went wrong here. But I may have just been overthinking it, but now you can see that once I um, moved the markers back, because what happened, um, you know, the CD wizard puts the markers right at the, um, the start of each clip, which, again, is too close to the downbeat. So I, I used to move multiple markers, and I'm moving the marker, the start marker, and the splice marker, which is the type of marker that the instrumental is for um, for for that particular reason. Um, moving the markers back 200 milliseconds, so that that puts it right at zero, because the clip was at 200, um, and that offsets the this marker by 200 milliseconds, and in doing that, you can see the track lengths are now exactly the same down to the milliseconds. So that's what we want. You know, I want to, when I send a cl this client the versions, I want the two files to be not only in sync, but the same length. So they don't say, why is the main version 318 and the instrumental is 319, you know, things like that. So normally that happens a lot faster when I'm not trying to do it live on YouTube. So now that I got the markers in place, let's talk about these files are super loud. Slight detour here. Um, I've had clients tell me that when they remove the limiter for mastering that they get some overs, and then they start overthinking that and start turning faders down, and then things can go wrong. Um, so this file was a floating point file, meaning it wasn't 24-bit or 16, it was floating point. And with floating point audio, if you turn it down, and there isn't there wasn't a ceiling like a limiter, you get all those peaks back, which is nice. So um, this happens sometimes. You know, the, when I did the first single, it was very quiet, and I showed you how the normalizer brought it up. Now, in this one, I'm going to show you how the meta normalizer can bring it down to your preferred starting point. And what looks like a problem, this at first look, this looks like a problem, right? Like it's going to be distorted, limited, clipped. It's not going to be something you can work with or improve upon. But since the file was saved as floating point instead of 24-bit, I can work with this, and I want to just demonstrate the meta normalizer again. So that's Shift-M. And I'm going to use my in-the-box setting to minus 16 top of loudness range. Now that's different than integrated, which is the entire song. It's just the loudest part of the song is going to be about 16, minus 16 LUFS. I hit apply and check it out. All the peaks are there and everything is fine now um, for the most, you know, everything. There's no distortion or clipping. The waveforms aren't chopped off. You know, if there would have been a limiter or if it would have been saved as 24 bit, yes, I could turn this down, but no, I would not be able to retain all the peak information. So it would sound pretty crunchy and distorted perhaps and not anything that you really want to add more processing to so that's kind of the difference between floating point 24 bit if you're running into problems like that let it clip just save it as floating point and the mastering person can deal with that just as you see here so i've rendered them um, now what, what i want to do though because this is a main and instrumental you'll go to the clips tab it rendered them to different levels 
Now, I found that th- that's not ideal because it did its job, but what it doesn't know is that I want these to sound exactly the same. So I can copy the main version normalization and paste it to the instrumental. So now they're going to sound the same. You know, the instrumental sections will sound exactly the same. To me, that's how I do my instrumentals. Is I apply the same processing as the main, assuming that they're both at the same, everything else is equal. Um, perhaps some people try to master the instrumental a little louder because there's no vocals in the way. I, I just keep it all the same. But you can copy the, the, the clip gain from the main version and paste it to the instrumental version very quickly. So now they're on the same page again as they originally were. They just turned down 10 decibels for a good starting point. So kind of the same deal, but um, I used to, like when I was mastering a single, I used to put the effects right on um, the clips for instrumentals as well. But I, I caught myself forgetting to either copy the plugin chain from the main version to the instrumental, or if I go back and update the main version, I found myself forgetting to apply those updates to the Clip effects. Let me show it. Show you what I mean. Um, you know. Well, first of all, let's say we have. You know, our limiter is a global setting on the master out. The output of the montage. So that's that is what it is. But the per song settings. Let's say I have this clip effects chain on the main version, and I'm, I I love how it sounds. Um, as you can see, you know, from the levels minus nine. Watch what happens when I play the instrumental it's quite a bit lower because the instrumental does not have any plugins applied and of course if you remember you, know, you can copy this plugin chain and paste it to the other one to the instrumental not a problem oops i got to do um, copy all which i have a shortcut for you know, i can paste all those plugins same plugins to the instrumental version And that's not a problem. So now, now these would sound the same. But the problem that happens is sometimes you go back and make some adjustments, and then you may forget to paste it over to the instrumental version or apply it at all. It's happened to me a couple times. Obviously, I catch it, but it's a waste. I'm wasting my time. So, in the case of doing a single and instrumental, I've decided to start using the track effects section which is something i didn't use a whole lot for a long time so i keep the clip effects empty and i just apply my main song effects on the track itself on the montage track now some people confuse this with cd track when it, the track it's referring to is the montage track right here so i'm going to apply my my per song settings on the track so that the main version and the instrumental get the same plug-in treatment. Um, this is kind of a problem in certain cases. And going back, the cool thing about clip effects is let's say I mastered that single and they love it, but now they're going to do an EP or an album. The nice thing there is um, the, the, the plugins for that song are right on the clip. And if I copy that clip to a new montage, the plugins go with it. So it's easy to keep all your per song settings in their own kind of compartment. But this is a little faster if if you're working like this to just put the plugins on the track. It's in this case it's the same effect because now no matter what I do, the main version and the instrumental are going to get the same plugin treatment. If I, you know, change stuff to the last minute and then I render it, they're going to be going through the same track effect because they're on the same montage track. So that's something I've been doing a little differently lately just so I don't make that mistake of forgetting to update the instrumental version. Um, let's go back to the marker names. Um, again, since this is an all-in-the-box project, um, I need to name the markers so that everything downstream makes sense. So I'm going to go name this marker um, the name of the song then I'm going to name this marker the name of the song plus instrumental that's just what I like to do I like to put instrumental in brackets like that you, you may want to choose parentheses or whatever you like to do but that's how I like to do it 
And again, naming the marker is really important. You don't want to name the clip. That can cause problems later. It doesn't really help you. Naming the marker is definitely the go-to way to do it. Then you can open up the CD text editor. And you can paste in the main info and arrange it. So the first page that I'm editing is the name of the release, which is, in the case of a single, it's going to be the same thing. But this would be like where I put the album title, as you can see. Um, and then in the album title page, you can press this button to populate the band name to all the songs. And then if you go to the first song, you can press this button. And that's going to grab the marker name that you just entered and put it as the track title, which is more apparent on track two. It, you can see that it automatically grabbed the marker name, which has instrumental in the name. So album name, song title, song two. Technically, the instrumental is track two. So now we got everything nicely named. I'll go back to my ISRC um, database here. And this is where I'd probably use the CD wizard because it's faster. I can choose ISRC only, paste in the first code, and it's going to generate, um, it's going to increment. You'll see that, of course, the first song will end in 5.1. If I go to the CD tab, the second song ends in 5.2. I would say in a lot, but not all cases, you know, the ISRC codes are in order, whether it's an album or a single and an instrumental. Um, so the CD wizard can help you there. But you do want to make sure you choose ISRC only because you don't want to make more markers and make more of a mess or change any clip arrangements. So you just want to do the ISRC only. Um, so as you can see, my track lengths are exactly the same down to the millisecond. And that's good. So let's say I'm really happy with how this sounds. I've got, this is the one time where I do use track effects so that, and this, this could work if you're doing a TV mix too. If you have th an alternate version with only the backing vocals or something, you could stack this up. This works in any number of files that you have, you know, or a clean or radio edit without any swear words. Um, the whole point is that it's multiple versions of the same song in a single format. So, the cool thing with track effects, like I said, is I don't have to remember to apply the right settings to each version because it's track effects. They're um, running live before the montage output. So it's the same kind of gain structure. We're just not using clip effects. And the other kind of bonus to this workflow is um, one of the new features of WaveLab 10 is the external editor, which I'll talk about. Usually by the time I get files into the montage, they're cleaned up as far, as far as clicks and pops, plosives, any kind of hissing noise. I've already cleaned them up before they've entered the montage. But let's say you're working and you hear a, a noise that you want to clean up. Um, you can use an external editor to fix that up. And when you're using clip effects, the external editor can get a little... Um, tricky because now your song is broken up into more than one clip and if you change the plug-in the EQ on the first part of the song then you have to make sure that all the other clips that make up the song have that change so it gets a little messy but one advantage to this workflow for singles you know singles are done kind of at a faster pace anyways um, let's say I heard a click or a pop here I could highlight it and I wish that I knew Spectra Layer 7 looks pretty amazing. I need to spend some time to learn it. But my external editor right now is um, RX. So I can, and I've set it here. Um, you can go to Preferences, External Applications. You could choose any external editor that you have. You know, Stereo, Two-Track Editor, Spectra Layer 7, um, 6 as I have here. Um, it could be any, most of them work. Point being, you can highlight that. I have a shortcut programmed, but if you go to the edit tab, you can press the external editor button. And now that little piece of audio is opened in RX. Now let's say that's a, a click that I want to get rid of right here. I can highlight it. 
remove the click, however, whatever you want to do to fix stuff, whatever needs to happen. I've been doing a lot of spectral DSing instead of using a DSer plugin. I found spectral DSing to be very effective. So you save the file, close it, and now in WaveLab, this little chunk is the saved, the cleaned up version saved in your timeline. Um, and this is why it gets messy with clip effects because um, then you have to make sure that you have the same clip effects on all these parts that make up the song if you were wanting the same effects, which you usually do. So anyways, it's nice to have an external editor option here um, and use it in a nice way to remove clicks. You can do some pretty quick spot cleanups. Whatever you got to do. Um, and this all plays nicely. And then because there's no clip effects, it's just feeding into the track effects, then your output effects like normal. So let's say that I'm happy with how this sounds. I'm going to remove a plugin or two to speed up the rendering process. But let's say I love how this sounds and I'm ready to render it. Couple, We just got a couple workarounds to deal with because of the marker quantizing. And that's only if you want to keep the file names the exact same length down to the millisecond. If you don't care about that, then you can ignore a little bit of what I'm about to say. But I'm doing the same steps here. I'm going to do the initial render. I'm going to navigate to the folder of the project. 96K renders. I'm going to give it a name. Now, the other cool thing with WaveLab is there's no files in that folder to display. So it's not going to preview that. But it does also have a list of recent files. So this is hot new single. I can just change it to HNS version one, but it's going into the the new the new project folder that I want, 96K renders. And I just press start and it's gonna render this. So same deal, it's gonna render one long pass of all the, of both versions and it's gonna create a new montage and I'm hoping in a future version this can change, but the little preset that I use to um, transfer the data from the source montage to the new one is the Q sheet. And when you use the Q sheet, because of the nature of CDs, it just has to um, quantize the markers. And that's a slight, again, not a problem, just a little quirk that we have to work around. So... Um, I'm going to show you how to, basically what I'm going to do is when this thing is done rendering, I'm going to delete the markers, which sounds crazy. I'm going to copy the markers from the source one, which is what we're looking at, and then paste it into the new one. So then instead of our markers being slightly, uh, the tracks being slightly different lengths by a few milliseconds, they're going to be the same again. And then I can render the files that I send out to the client. So once this is done, I will show you what that looks like. Um, Cause I would say most of the time when I get instrumentals and main versions, they're the exact same length and we want to keep them that way so that everything's in sync. So um, I think it's good to keep it that way. Now it gets a little tricky when songs start with vocals and there's three seconds of a vocal on the main version and then it's kind of your judgment call if do you keep three seconds of silence on the instrumental so it remains in sync. Could be handy for video editors, or do you trim it up tight so it starts right? I mean, there's no right answer. But first of all, I'm going to rename, or I'm going to, to name the resulting montage and get it saved. The stream Deck is doing the work for me. And it's going to prompt me to load in a dither plugin right away because that's what I'm going to do. So as you'll notice... Now my track lengths are slightly off by a few milliseconds. Some might not think it's a problem. Some might think it's a problem. But I'm going to show you how to solve it. Um, I'm going to do it the slow way first. But basically what I'm doing is deleting these markers, which again seems crazy. I'm going to copy these markers. Copy all markers. I do need to put the cursor at the zero so that when I paste the markers, they paste from zero. But now, as you'll see, now the markers are the same length again. Um, I knew that that was kind of tedious, so I developed a Stream Deck shortcut. So here's what it looked like when it rendered. 
marker is slightly off. I have a little Stream Deck shortcut that does it very quickly. So within less than a second, probably, I'll, I'll undo that. Less than a second, it toggles to the original. No, in less than a second, it deletes the markers, toggles to the source montage, copies those markers, makes sure the cursor is at zero, and then it repastes the markers. So watch this happen really quickly. And then when you go to the CD tab, you can see it still has the ISRC code, the CD text, which of course gets transposed to metadata. So now I'm ready to render again. Um, so, because I've got the dither, actually I don't, maybe I undid that. Got the dither loaded. So I have a 96K montage, 24 bit dither. I'm going to choose my 2496 single preset. Um, and similar to before, I'm going to copy the file name to to be the folder name, cr delete the dot wave, and render these in. And then I can go back to Rx and do some sample rate conversion. Convert the floating point 96 version down to 48K. And while I'm here, I'll convert the floating point 96 version down to 44.1. And while that's going, I can go back to WaveLab and do the custom montage duplicate. Now it's a 48K montage, and I can render the, those waves. I can do the duplicate again, and now point it to the 44.1 version. And this, you know, maybe you don't send all these versions, but I like to send a variety of formats and let clients decide, or at least make them aware of what, what everything's for because it's going to depend on their distributor and what, what they're actually doing. The, the other day I had an old client reach out for, they just said, I need the WAV files for this record from a few years ago. And I said, well, you know, what are you doing with the WAV files? Is it digital distribution? Are you making a music video? It turned out to be for sync licensing and we, I was able to send them 48K versions because that's what the sync agency wanted. So that made everything a little better probably instead of leaving them to their own devices to do the conversions. So I'm going to render the MP3 single. And now, as you can see, if I go to this folder, I have um, the main version and the instrumental version in all the, the five formats I showed last time. Um, the other thing I like to do is maybe make, I have some pre I have some folders made that don't have anything in them, but I just use them for, because they're already named correctly. I can drop them in there to kind of keep it a little more organized. And then again, if we go to any kind of metadata program, you can see that even the WAV files have metadata and the mp3 has the artwork and wavelab will do the artwork in waves it's just that very few programs can show it so i tend to skip it but it's there if you want it so that's basically how i do a single songs in wavelab whether it's one version or multiple versions of the same song instrumental clean radio edit um, tv mix so um, i think i basically covered everything i want to um Somebody said they posted a question and wondering if it's gone, and maybe it's... It looks like it is gone. If you want to ask it again, I don't know what happened. But I'm going to make sure I got all the other questions answered before we... Um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to scroll through the questions to see um, if there are any. I think I got most of them while I was working yeah so if anyone if there's no more questions I guess you can go over 
um, to the Wave Lab Facebook users group. Ask it there, and I'll I'll respond. I'm going to see if this question comes through. Otherwise, as I mentioned earlier in the video, um, within a week or two from the from this airing, check out uh, it's going to be wavelabhelp.com, and it's going to have links to all the shortcuts and stuff I'm doing presets. Um, just to help you work faster and smarter in WaveLab, and um, links to book a one-on-one -on -one session over Zoom. I did a, a number of those in the past year, and they were kind of fun to do. Um, I just had people kind of organically reach out, and it was it's kind of nice to do those once in a while. So if you want a one-on-one -on -one session, we can set that up. Um, it's going to link to some things that are hard to find, like you know the shortcuts a pdf of all the shortcuts in wave lab so anyways um, this question seems to have disappeared so i'm going to wrap it up but thanks for tuning in i'm going to do one in about a month from now uh, and um, if anyone has any topic ideas feel free to post them in the facebook uh, wave lab users group and i'll consider that for a future episode and of course if any questions come up from this video um, Here's a question. Spectral editing, I usually bounce the whole track so I can use the clip effects. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, as I mentioned, I usually um, I usually clean up the file externally before I bring it into the montage. So it's kind of the same pro you know kind of the same concept is where I, I like to keep my clips for songs the same as one. I don't like to break my songs up into multiple clips unless, a section needs a special set of plugins, and of course, that's kind of what it's for. But if I have a, let me open up the other song. You know, I if I'm going to be using clip effects, I don't like to break it up into a bunch of clips because then you got problems managing all the clip effects and making sure they are the same, which is kind of what you want most of the time. There is a way to bounce you can go to um, process and bounce and bouncing will kind of lock in all the plugins it'll make a new clip with all the plugins locked in but then it, you can't really go back so what I like to do is um, keep my songs as one clip and do the initial um, cleanup as one whole file if I'm working all in the box and then if I find additional things to clean up later, I'll just close wave lab, go back and fix the file and then either save it as the same name. So wave lab just links to the newly, you know, the fixed up the additionally um, fixed version, or I can save it as, you know, repaired version two, and then I can load version two into the montage and keep, keep working. Um, it kind of depends Sometimes I'll start mastering without any cleanup so I can kind of get a feel for how much it's going to need. You know, some some projects have tons of mouth clicks and clicks from bad edits, and some have very few to none. So sometimes I'll just start mastering first to get a feel for it, and then I'll close Wave Lab, do some spectral repair once I'm kind of cued into what things are going to pop out after limiting and raising the average loudness so much, what's going to be a problem, and then... I will open WaveLab back up and either load in the, because if the file's the same length, it's not going to cause a problem, load in the fixed up version or, again, if I've already fixed it, I could um, do additional fixes, give it the same name and overwrite it, and then WaveLab just grabs the newly fixed file. So there's a few ways to manage that, but I, I really don't like to have my clips broken up, but as I mentioned, one advantage to the, one advantage to the workflow of having it on track effects is that it kind of doesn't matter that the song is broken up into many clips because there's no clip effects to manage. All these little clips are getting fed to the track effects. So in a way, it makes things easier. Kind of works in a single situation, but certainly doesn't work well in an EP or album situation because then you end up with a lot of tracks in your montage and it gets messy. So um, hopefully that answers the question there. But um, great question, and I think I'm going to call it a day here. But thanks for tuning in, and um, 
We'll see you next month.